So today we're starting a new semi-regular series on the blog. I'm calling it Schlock and Awe, in which we take a film that the world loves to hate and we praise it for all of its unsung merits. There's quite a bit of my critical philosophy in this. I tend to go a lot easier on so-called schlocky films than most professional critics. I believe that my background in filmmaking, as opposed to film reviewing, has a lot to do with this. It takes a lot of hard work just to make a crappy film, much less a good one. Whoever made that film you didn't like this weekend had much better reasons for making it than you did for watching it. So I say meet these filmmakers halfway. Judge the films on their own merits. Watch the movies for what they are. You do that, and you'll find that there's plenty of value to be mined from a whole host of films that popular consensus all too quickly deems worthless tripe. I'll let you decide if that's a fault or a virtue, but in the meantime, I'm gonna be over here having literal metric shit tons of fun. For the inaugural episode of this series, we're gonna take a look at what is perhaps my all-time favorite schlock film, The Chronicles of Riddick. Chronicles of Riddick tells the story of one Richard B. Riddick. Why he doesn't go by Dick Riddick, I'll never know. An outlaw, a convict, hiding out on a frozen backwater planet at the ass end of the galaxy, who's called back to civilization to help put a stop to an evil empire's plot to take over the universe. Hey, wait, didn't I just summarize the plot of Star Wars? Whatever, we'll come back to that in a bit. In fact, Chronicles of Riddick is equal parts Star Wars, Conan the Barbarian, and even a little bit Macbeth. And while not everyone may appreciate its finer elements, it does itself better than most any other tongue-in-cheek sci-fi actioner I've ever seen. At the beginning of the film, our growly anti-hero Riddick is called back to civilization by one of his last remaining friends, who hopes that Riddick can help put a stop to the evil Lord Marshall, hereafter referred to as Space Hitler. who's busy traveling from planet to planet, converting or killing every last inhabitant of the galaxy. Riddick doesn't want anything to do with it at first. Not my fight. As far as Riddick's concerned, the galaxy never did him any favors, so why should he do any favors for the galaxy? Had done sometime. But soon enough, the Lord Marshal's troops invade the city. And while Riddick may pretend to be all cold and disaffected on the outside, Deep down, he's really just a big softy. Let's get your family. But while Riddick and his friend are making their escape, the two get separated, and one of the Lord Marshal's goons kills Riddick's friend. That will be an afterlife for me. Will that be for you? That's only a first act spoiler, nobody freak out. So Riddick decides that before he goes back into hiding, he might as well kill the goon that killed his friend. Which he does. The very next morning, in fact. But Riddick didn't really plan this one out. Stop him! He slaughters the goon in full view of the Lord Marshal himself. Yeah, One of my best. If you say so. The Lord Marshal is intrigued by Riddick's enigmatic style and his skills with a blade, so he has him detained for questioning. But soon enough, those same skills that initially impressed the Lord Marshal are busy terrifying him. So he tries to kill Riddick. Kill the Riddick. But Riddick escapes. Where's he off to next? To the inescapable prison planet of Crematoria. If I owned this place in hell, I'd rat this place out and live in hell. Home to Kira, his last remaining friend of the whole galaxy. Meanwhile, the Lord Marshal appoints a special task force to pursue Riddick and take him out once and for all. This segment of the film, the one that covers Crematoria, the second act, if you will, in which Riddick allows himself to be captured by Mercs, to be put in with the other criminals so that he can find Kira, to survive the hazards of a triple max prison long enough to turn the guards against each other, and then run 30 clicks across the planet's surface with a boiling hot horizon right behind him in order to make his escape, is one of the most exciting, inventive, and downright beautiful 51 minutes of action sci-fi cinema I've ever seen. I'll stand by that. Remember when we were talking about Star Wars earlier? Both films follow the guiding framework of the monomyth. The monomyth is something that I've outlined in other videos, so I won't go into the whole spiel here, but suffice it to say, I believe that Riddick's writer-director David Twohey is just as good, if not better than, George Lucas at exemplifying the monomyth and using it to tell his story. Simply put, I think Chronicles of Riddick is more entertaining than A New Hope. If you put a lightsaber in Riddick's hand and called him a rogue Jedi, I'm convinced Chronicles of Riddick would go down as a sci-fi classic. And I won't give away the ending, but let's just say that if Riddick does manage to take out Space Hitler, it won't be because of an exposed exhaust port.
Did I mention Chronicles of Riddick passes the Bechtel test? Because it totally does. Tandy Newton's portrayal of Dame Vaco is one of the more compelling Lady Macbeths I've ever seen in a film. She goads her husband every chance she gets into trying to kill the Lord Marshal and take over his empire. And she plays fantastically well against Judy Dench's Arian, a member of the elemental race, who's obsessed with restoring balance to the universe. You don't pray to our god. You pray to no god, I hear. They're polar opposites, and it's great fun to watch them chew scenery together. Calculate the odds of you getting off this planet alive, and now cut them in half. No, we can't fly. But we glide very well. So all this begs the question, why isn't Chronicles of Riddick a classic? Why is it currently batting 29% on Rotten Tomatoes? Why is it only netting 38 out of 100 on Metacritic.com? Why did it bomb at the box office? Why is my glowing praise and semi-decent home video sales the only two things this film has got going for it? To answer these questions, I conducted a fantastically unscientific survey of the billions of negative reviews on the internet of this film. And I singled out two main criticisms that keep popping up. Genre and lead actor. As for the genre, that's a matter of taste, not quality. You can't say the film itself is bad just because the genre isn't your cup of soup. Tea, actually. Nobody ever says that Chronicles of Riddick is a bad example of campy sci-fi action, they just say that they're not fans of campy sci-fi action. And I get that. Nobody wants to eat cheese all day every day. Some people are even lactose intolerant, and I don't hold that against them. But I personally couldn't go more than a week without some of that sweet Wisconsin dairy. I'll kill you with my teacup. The second big complaint is Vin Diesel. They say he's just some muscly meathead, a talking mannequin, about as talented an actor as an upside down broom with a smiley face painted on it. Fucking insulting. Let me say this. I believe that Vin Diesel is as good an actor as he needs to be. Maybe just a little self-aware, but so are the characters that he tends to play. I love him. And nobody does growly anti-hero better than Vin Diesel. Nobody does growly traditional hero better than Vin Diesel. You stay. Seriously, if you really think Vin Diesel is just some muscly meathead, I'd encourage you to go watch his first short film, Multifacial, which is freely available on YouTube. Then you can come back and apologize. Some faggot out of nowhere, I'm talking about a real homo, runs up to the guy I just smacked. He's screaming, oh my god, Richard, stop, please, like a, a little fairy like this. I'm like, oh shit, what is it? And runs up and hugs this guy I just smacked. Yeah, I did the monologue you gave me. Yeah, yeah, I told him it was a true story, but couldn't I have been a little less offensive? So now we come to the end of the inaugural episode of Schlock and Awe, and I have this idea. I want to give out a rating for each film that I take a look at in the series, but it won't be a number. Awarding films numbered scores has never really made much sense to me. Numbers are objective, and opinions are not. I'd rather hand out a more personalized award, one which befits the specific tones and merits and styles of any given film that we're looking at. And because this is the internet, all of my awards are going to take the form of booze. So with that said, here we go. The Chronicles of Riddick gets the Mexican Rompope Award. Because they're both deceptively simple products with surprisingly complex undertones, which suggests that way more skill went into their creation than you'd originally think. They're also dairy-based and full of sugar, which means they're best enjoyed in concentrated bursts, but not necessarily all day, every day. And I won't hold it against you if it's not your style. I mean, I guess. It's my life. 